Last Battle, Yeshima 1945, is a small war game about a battle uh, in World War II in the Pacific, Americans versus Japanese. And maybe the title could have been Storm over Yeshima because the game system is an air impulse system that has been fairly popular in the last couple of, I would say, decades um, and that has been made particularly known, visible uh, by a line of games called Storm over, followed by the place where the game is set from Storm over Stalingrad being one of the most well known classics. Um, to storm over tired Zhuang and so on and so forth. So we have an air impulse game which is small and the air impulse system really works well for confrontations that have a certain hmm, grinding factor, grinding element. When you have two forces that may be non-symmetrical, one of them may be considerably stronger than the other, hmm, but one of, but the defender has some advantages due to terrain, due to other factors. So the advance of the stronger force is slowed down by the defense, by the resistance of the defender. Again, perfect for example in Storm over Stalingrad, which is about a battle that is precisely of this kind. Last battle, Yashima 1945, published by Revolution Games. So yes, it comes as a, as a folio game in a Ziploc bag, so it's not as production. Uh, in terms of production values may not be as immediately appealing as, again, that comes in a box, but it also reduces costs. And Revolution Games is a very solid publisher of games. Uh, the war games that I play by them, to different extents, they were all very convincing, very well done, uh, very reliable. So I was pretty excited when I received Last Battle and I put it on the table to play. Let me show you how the game works. Here you see the map of the game, which is printed on a single paper map, uh, which, however, lays flat very easily. Uh, as you can see here, I haven't even used a piece of plexiglass. It shows the area <coughs> of the confrontation, with the island where the battle took place. We have boxes where we store the American units before they land on the areas connected with arrows to their, uh, to their beach approach boxes. And there we have a box where we place the Japanese units before the beginning of the game, the special Japanese units that will be added later. There are some Japanese units on the board at the beginning and you see them there. The game, uh, the board is divided in areas. Each area has an indication in the middle with a number on top which simply identifies the area and a terrain modifier at the bottom such as plus two in this case or plus three there. As you can see some areas of have a circular round identifier and those are general areas and then we have some areas with a square identifier and those are urban areas and there are special effects that may be related to that. Now, um, the, that game is divided in impulses, well in turns divided in impulses. We have four turns in the standard game and each uh, turn is divided in impulses. Each uh, impulse is divided in a Japanese impulse and an American impulse. When the American uh, is taking their impulse, one of the die rolls is used to determine if the game will continue into another impulse the same day or whether you will move to the next day. To do so, you use the first die roll that the American um, makes for any whatever function. If the American does not roll dice because of normal game functions, then you simply roll the dice once to determine whether the impulse uh, moves to the next or the same day or you go to the next day. When you roll dice to determine the advancement of the impulse, simply put the number that you roll on 2d6 if the number is higher than or equal um, to the present impulse number, then the game continues in the same day. I have a 3, I roll say a 5, then the game continues. Even if I roll a 3, the game continues the same day, but if I roll the same number as the present impulse, I flip the marker and now the weather has changed from clear to rain, or of course if it was rain then it would change from rain to clear with slightly different effects based on that. If I rolled a number which is lower than the present impulse number then the game moves to the next day.
During each of your impulses, you can do one of four things. So one thing, you can pass, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Or you can choose to regroup, which means you can activate any and all of your units on the board to move into an adjacent area, but they cannot enter areas occupied by enemies with that move. Or you can choose to do bombardments. There are markers that the players can use to bombard the opponent. For example, these are two of the markers that the Americans have. Uh, when you choose bombardment, you do not move. You simply place the marker in the area that you want to bombard. You resolve an attack and then you flip the marker to its use side. As a reminder, you cannot use it again for this time. And we'll talk later about how bombardment is resolved. It is resolved like regular combat, it's just that um, it, it uses different sets of modifiers. Or, of course, the most, the main type of impulse is the assault impulse, where you activate your units to move and possibly attack. To activate your units for an assault, you choose an area and you activate the units in that area and beach approach areas count as such areas for that purpose and when you activate units you can move them up to their movement allowance which is the number printed in on the right side of the unit the bottom right corner that is the movement allowance entering a new area costs a movement point that is uh, movement points are not based on terrain but the cost may, may be affected by the presence of enemy units so it costs more to move adjacent to enemy units and it costs even more to move into areas containing enemy units finally when you move you may start an attack because maybe by moving you enter an area containing enemy units and then you can you can fight now how does combat work? For combat, you need to, des to designate one of your unit as the lead unit. We'll say that this is the lead unit for the Americans and this is the lead unit for the Japanese in that fight. Then you need to total the uh, total attack factor for the attacker and the total defense factor for the uh, defender. Total attack, you roll 2d6, then you add the combat value of the lead unit, that would be 4 in this case, plus a point for each full strength unit that the attacker has in the fight, and or half a point for each reduced units rounding down. So these two units will contribute a single point to the total attack factor. Also, there may be other modifiers such as, for example, uh, air support, if there is clear weather, other modifiers coming from optional rules. Uh, but this is the main idea. Attack factor, 2d6 plus lead unit and other contributions from other units. For the defender, you total the combat strength of the, of the lead unit plus a point for each unit that is supporting the lead unit plus terrain modifier, of course that goes in the advantage of the defender, that would be that one, plus possibly air support, plus rubble markers if the fight is taking place in an urban area and you're using that optional rule, and you add the result of 2d6s. So 2d6s plus lead unit, support from other units, terrain and other modifiers. And then you see, if the defense total is higher than the attack factor of the attacker, then the attacker is repulsed, there is no damage for the defender's unit, all of the attacking units are flipped to the reduced side, and they're already reduced, they're eliminated. Uh, if the two sides have the same value, then there's a st stalemate, the lead unit is flipped to its reduced side, or destroyed, eliminated if it's already reduced and then the defending units may choose to retreat. Finally, if the attack is successful, hooray! The lead attacking unit is still flipped to its reduced side. Uh, the lead unit always takes a hit. The defender then has to take a number of hit points, or attrition points, equal to the difference between the total attack and the total defense. And those points must be spent by, by reducing units, by eliminating units, or by retreating units. For example, to eliminate a full strength unit uh, absorbs three attrition points. To uh, flip a full strength unit to its reduced side costs a single point, or I should say, uh, absorbs a single point of, of attrition. Retreating a reduced unit also costs uh, or absorbs a point of attrition, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier uh, Bombardment. Bombardment works in the same way, that is, you still have an attack value and you add the result of a die roll of 2d6 and you compare with the total of the defender. It's just the total of the defender during Bombardment is simply the value, the defensive value of the area, the terrain, plus possibly rubble markers if you're using them and 2d6s. So basically the combat factor of the units that are being bombarded doesn't matter, which of course makes perfect sense because we're talking about bombardment. At the end of each day there is a night phase during which the Japanese player gets to act and gets an advantage for being able to perform in things at night. Also at that point there is a refit phase when the players get refit points that they can use to rebuild destructed units or refit uh, restore reduced units and then you start the next day and you continue like that. Uh, this is the basic idea, there are uh, advanced rules and optional rules that give you more detail and more options. Uh, actually one non-optional um, non thing is the advantage marker. The game starts with the Americans having the advantage. The advantage marker gives you uh, one of several bonuses. For example, you can choose to reroll a die if your role was particularly unsuccessful but the point is that once you use the advantage you will have to then give the advantage you flip it and you give the advantage to the opponent other than that this is the game you alternate impulses activate move around and continue like this the japanese player trying to defend the island in particular defending valuable victory point areas like the ones that you see here the American player keeps pushing against the Japanese. The American player achieves automatic victory if at any point, at the end of any impulse, um, the, the American controls every area on the map. Otherwise, he goes until the end of the game, uh, the end of April 19th, the fourth day of the battle. And at that point, you determine victory by totaling victory points that the American player gains by controlling victory point areas. The American player loses victory points depending on the number of units that have been eliminated. And if at that point, after you total and, and subtract, the American player has at least 10 victory points, the American player wins the game. So yes, this is a solid design and definitely it captures well the possibilities that the area impulse system creates. There is precisely this sense of the Americans being so incredibly overwhelming, having so much power against those small, weak Japanese labor units. But yet at the same time, uh, there's still tension because terrain, other advantages, because the different <clears throat> biology, the different synergy, as you say, of the, of the units uh, allows the Japanese player to still put up a defense which is desperate, made of units that are weakened, that retreat, that then come back, that from time to time get restored, but it's still pretty a desperate cycle of retreat, try to survive, retreat, reform units that were destroyed, um, but it works very well precisely because it creates this low but very tense advancement uh, of, the, of the American player towards the objectives. As the Japanese, it's hard to really push the Americans back, but you can delay them enough and you can inflict enough pain to, uh, to still win the game. Um, and this is what, word ga what good word gaming does, really. It captures non-symmetrical situations that historically were tilted towards one of the sides and turns them into designs that are nevertheless interesting to play uh, for both sides due to different uh, situations, different victory conditions. Victory conditions that allow you to win the game even if the battle does not go um, your way in strictly historical terms. Uh, the non-symmetrical situation also adds to the replay value of the game because playing the two sides is a very different experience. The game is absolutely 100% uh, solitaire friendly, you can play the game at the best of your possibilities, uh, playing both sides and it's still interesting, you still have that kind of tension, you still have an interesting progression. What is interesting is that um, when you have an area impulse system game that is meant to reproduce a slow and painful advance through obstacles, through an enemy defense, um, one of the risks may be that the game lasts too long. Okay, this this is a system that works very well to slow, to show slow, painful advance, 
Um, but in this case, you do not have the problem of an overextended length. The game doesn't um, doesn't overstay its welcome because this map is so small. The map uh, does not uh, the map the system the number of pieces involved the overall design does not make the game last too long. You can play the game easily in a session. You can play. You can probably put together two games in a single session. Maybe you switch sides if you're playing against an opponent, and you see who. Uh, does better as the side that is being slowly overwhelmed, but um, so definitely you have an interesting, uh, good combination, good balance there. You have mechanics that to uh, put obstacles in your in your way, especially as an American player. But the overall uh, framing of the design is not one that will turn this game into a long dragging context. It just I think hits a sweet spot. You have. This kind of experience, uh, this kind of like painful fight against an obstacle, against a very resistant, uh, resistant medium, but at the same time, uh, the game still is short enough to have a clearly defined narrative, not to feel like a flat repetition of fight, repeat, retreat, put people back, fight again, etc., etc. And yet the map is small, and when I looked at it, I was like, I don't know how this map is really gonna give us. Uh, much fun because it almost looked like like a postcard game uh, expanded, just photocopied on a bigger on a bigger map. But as it turned out, turned out that actually the map has a couple of interesting um, points, uh, interesting aspects, features to it that still call for a couple of interesting decisions. As a Japanese player, you may concentrate your forces on on the beaches and then the American player may drive behind you and surround you and drive towards valuable victory point areas. You can uh, create a thinner line of defense that uh, cuts the island north to south so you're not only protecting the beaches but also the area behind them and of course that means that each of your points of defense is, is, uh, is weaker to me this is interesting, very often games with the very strong dichotomy, attacker, defender, the defender is pretty much forced to just react to what the, uh, the attacker does. Here to me there is a more interesting synergy because as the Japanese player you go first so you need to set up your defenses. Actually this team attacker they very often will have to react to what you do maybe trying to outmaneuver you if you concentrate it too much in an area um, try to figure out the weakest point if you create an extended line of defense and at that point of course the Japanese player needs to react to that so I found that there was a more interesting back and forth uh, of decisions between the two sides that you have in many war games that have a strong uh, attacker defender dichotomy so last battle of Yeshima it's a small game um, could work as a beginner's game, uh, small but smart game. It is a smart game that uh, packs quite a punch, it delivers a very tense and interesting experience in a game that is easy to play, quick to set up, um, fast to play, and yet still has a very interesting tension factor, still creates an interesting narrative. Also the subject is not one of the most gamed ones in word gaming, so it is for many of us an opportunity to explore a topic that you may not know much about or you may have never explored through word gaming before. Last battle, Yashima 1945. Definitely a good word game that I recommend to anybody who is interested in a game that is not too hard to play but still pretty fun to play.